Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of the Tourismus Namibia live broadcast. My name is Frank Steffen, I'm the editor of Tourismus Namibia and uh, also of the Allgemeine Zeitung. Welcome to the show. Um, we hope to bring you a lot of news again, some better, some worse. Um, but then obviously we'll be uh, phoning into Claude Deer, who is still uh, uh, up at the coast or down the coast, wherever you want to describe it, depending where you are. Um, but she'll be telling us a bit about the coast as you go up to the, uh, towards Skeleton Coast. And then later on, um, I've prepared just a little talk for to the point. So let's first see what the market has to offer and then we'll proceed with the topics. Uh, not everything is good news. We generally had a very good uh, rain season this year, but uh, Republican actually tells us about something that is quite a sad state of affairs up in uh, Upuvu, or actually Konene region, which is partly Koko Felt and then uh, Damra land. As you can see there, there has been no rain whatsoever. So uh, the drought is still prevalent in the northwest of Namibia, as you can see, Kokoland, Amaraland, as I said, and they essentially make up the Konena region, which has hardly received any rain this year, and only in some of the areas last year. So um, this is an uh, area that has become over the years increasingly uh, dependent on, on tourism and with the income also gone as a result of COVID-19, uh, these people are now literally facing hunger. So um, th there does not seem to be any solution. Uh, so people are getting very desperate is what one of the guys, uh, Wadamembu Mutambo said. Um, he's from uh, uh, Opuvo, he's settled there just like many others have done, but he actually comes from Okorosava, which is close to Opuvo. And uh, it seems that uh, Pastor Eric van Seil is the guy who actually tries to, to bring some aid to these people now. Um, he's actually been bringing milli meal and food supplies to these remote areas. Uh, last week he apparently uh, distributed roughly 1.6 tons of food um, in the Konena region as a whole. And in February he actually transported 850 kilograms of milli meal to this region in a land cruise and trailer. I think you saw it on one of the photos earlier. So next up, he, he obviously, yeah, there you can actually see the, the uh, vehicle in which he does it. And um, so next up, he, he plans to bring supplies to remote areas such as Itanga. So Itanga is quite far northwest uh, as you go toward Fon uh, towards uh, Fonsales Pass and, and those areas. Yeah, that's Kaoka Land. So uh, really a sad story. Um, if you can help and, and you are interested, maybe you can uh, contact him uh, f uh, through us. Uh, we can at least try and establish, uh, establish the contact. Then up next, uh, interesting story was uh, the Ministry of Environment uh, and, and Forestry and Tourism has actually called on farmers this week to, to actually uh, put in their claims if they've uh, suffered any damages on account of elephants. Uh, damaging their property or crops and, or for that matter, installations. So there is an existing program that is designated to compensate farmers for damage created by wildlife that is uh, conserved in um, neighboring uh, areas and, and which wander into the farmland. Incidentally, this is, by the way, the, the area where the Canadian oil exploration company Recon Africa maintains that it is not an ecologically sensitive area. You know, it makes me wonder somehow uh, why we encounter elephants uh, that damage property and further find that they're not shot, but rather, um, uh, you know, farmer being, be, farmers being compensated. So that certainly would indicate that there is wildlife number one and uh, these ecologies are maintained at all costs. So, um, yeah, but uh, as I said, all the farmers, this is basically 
I would say mostly north, uh, um, northeastern Namibia as you go Kavangu areas and, and then obviously in the Zambezi area, um, Zambezi region for that matter. And then finally we've got uh, quite an interesting, uh, interesting article which we had in the Allgemeine Zeitung this week. And uh, so we're talking of the giants of the Kunene. And if you look at this uh, photo of a fish, I mean, if that isn't a giant, I don't know what a giant is. Um, so uh, the Namibian records for dusky cob in this case, it's uh, called Agirosomus japonicus. Uh, that's the Latin name, so excuse my pronunciation if that wasn't 100% in line. But uh, they've been, uh, the, the records need to be reassessed because since November 2020, fish have been drawn ashore in the mouth of the Konene which are now known now as the giants of the Konene. Uh, this photo is of uh, Reimert Lindfeld in the center there. You can see he's absolutely delighted. Who caught uh, uh, this cob that measures 188 centimeters and whose uh, weight was therefore estimated at, at just under 72 kilograms. So that's, that's a grown up person's weight. Um, and the, the tour guides from Namap Desert Tours, Hannes Kruger on the left there, and Jacques de Vett on the right, as well as Lawrence Ferry and Renier de Villiers were part of the picture. So obviously they had a ball. Uh, the fish was released within two minutes after it had uh, been caught and obviously swam away. And uh, it now seems as if they are seriously looking into do, uh, doing more research into why these fish grow to such a huge size up there at the Kunene Mont. Yeah, and that is uh, really the three topics that I brought this week. Um, yeah, like I said, the, the Kunene is, uh, is, is a good area in some ways, but it's a harsh area. So um, if you can come to aid, at least just consider it. Um, that's our topics for today. Next up, we'll be talking to uh, Chloe Deer. Like I said, she's uh, waiting up there along the skeleton coast, trying to find the, be the best spot to, to speak to us. We hope to get her uh, uh, into the studio very well, connected to the studio very soon. Welcome back, and as I said earlier, we wanted to talk or want to talk to Chloe, and uh, we've finally been able to get hold of her. So, Chloe, are they there? Oh, the wind nearly blew me over there. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Frank. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, good stuff. So, are you well? Yes, I'm well. I'm, and I'm you are? really comfortable in my environment here. <laughs> Is it? Okay. On the beach. Okay, yes. so you are where exactly now? I'm on the coast. Um, I actually, we tried to film at the um, shipwreck, which is 16 kilometers from Henke's Bay, but there was just no signal. So even though the picture was amazing, the signal was terrible. So I've just come along the coast and there's some fishermen fishing over there. And um, yeah, I've just found a sand dune and some signal. So this is a great spot to... Yeah, we can actually hear you very well. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So, so uh, destinations, you wanted to bring us three different ones, Cross Cape being the first? Yeah, Cape Cross. Um, obviously, since I've been in the Dorb National Park and in the area, I've really tried to explore, um, you know, all the attractions. And Cape Cross is, you know, just before you enter um, the Skeleton Coast National Park. But it's one of the biggest um, Cape Seal um, colonies um, in um, Namibia and I have to say I mean this is outside of breeding season and um, I'm not sure if you can hear the sounds of the seals but I was really impressed by um, how close you were able to get to them they're so vicious I mean when you think of the seal I used to think of this kind of like fluffy you know they are vicious they bark they sound like sheep I have to say that if you go there without a mask on you'll be very disappointed because it stinks so much but I have to say 
<laughs> it was a beautiful sight, but I, ha I every time, I mean, I saw the pups, and I just, you know, you almost want to go squish them. They're so cute, yeah. but they, um, the parents are so horrible to them. Anyway, that was, I mean, we really aren't going for very many facts right now, but I'm just saying it was quite an overwhelming experience. <laughs> it and was actually, I'm, I'm sure, but especially because of the smell, because it's unbelievable it stink bad. out there. You know, it's the one and only time where wearing a mask outside of Corona was by choice. You know, I absolutely was, I couldn't handle the smell. But um, but nevertheless, I got some beautiful photographs. And, yeah, you know, they aren't, they, they, they seem to be very um, comfortable around people, um, yeah. which, I mean, there is a boardwalk, but they've broken through the boardwalk and they lie on it. So there yeah. isn't really, you know, it, you kind of just walk in and amongst them. Um, yeah. And, yeah, they... They seem to often be in a bad mood, so when you walk past them, there's a lot of barking and they sound a bit like sheep. But it was still an unbelievable experience for me because it was obviously I've never I've never been to a seal colony, um, and I would love to see it when when all of them are actually there because this is less than a quarter of the number of seals that you would usually see. Um, but um, yeah, they obviously have um, have migrated and they'll be back or however it works. Um, mm. I haven't really done much research, but I have to say, it's worth it's worth going to. So long as you've got a face no, or a mask, it's yeah. worth going to for sure. Yeah, and actually the area is very nice as well. And uh, by the way, in peak season, very. they actually go up to two hundred thousand animals. So it's it's immense. I this is so I've cute. Look that. at this one. They've got such he sort of beady eyes. I know, and they, I mean, they're so intrigued by the camera. This one came right up to the camera and basically was just like <laughs> sniffing it and, you know, but it was really, it was a really special experience. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I would love to see it when, I mean, the water was just full of seals. Yeah. So I yeah. can't imagine they get much food to share because they, they, they can't, you know, it's just crazy. There's so many of them. Um, it's actually happened last year the when they when they lost so many of the, of the young ones. Um, they had a serious problem at one stage there because there wasn't enough food. Exactly what you're saying. I, I would imagine so because even out of season, um, I struggle to imagine how all of them get fed. Maybe yeah. that's why they're so grumpy. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I also went to um, Cape Cross um, Lodge after kind of to wash off the dead, because uh, I went swimming in the Dead Sea, and yeah. they let me um, shower in their campsite. Yeah. And that's a great place to position it yourself. It is, you know, actually, they, the lodge the itself is really nice. Facilities yeah. And the campsites are great, you know, on yeah. the beach. So, um, a great place to stop. Yeah. No, I actually stayed there once during December, and it's, it's a magic place. It's, and, and don't make a mistake, it's far enough that the smell doesn't reach you. Oh, well, that's good to know. No, yeah. yeah. No, and then up next you had the lichen fields. Yeah, the lichen. You know, we um, I obviously I'm always drawn to color, but I, I have to say that these lichen fields they're uh, uh, they are the result of a mixture between fungi and algae. And um, the plains just before you exit um, uh, um towards Cape Cross, there are just fields of lichen that um, you know, in the early morning it's the best time to go because that's when the fog kind of has um, moistened them and kind of and their their color comes to life but before I went I read that if you poured water on them they kind of reawaken and um, I have a video which will probably play just now where I pour water and you can actually see it come to life although the color wasn't exactly what I had seen um, it was still you know just another fascination of the numbers you know and and um, less is spoken about as well um, but yeah. other than the ones that kind of look like little bushes on the black rocks they are also beautiful um, lichen stones um, and yeah just really overwhelming when you are you know in them and they're such a delicate um, biome that obviously you have to be careful with driving over them um, with cars and things like that but I think towards the end of this video you'll see what happens when you pour water onto the lichen and how they um, start to photosynthesize and and their um, their color and everything starts to emerge, um, no. which was really really beautiful to see. Um, tell that tell me, is this still now. in Dolo? Yep, this is. Um, this is just still along the um, the C thirty four, and um, you you'll find the um, 
you'll find them right away along the coastline. But this designated kind of pl plain um, yeah. is just full of them. And um, yeah, they really are quite breath breathtaking. Yeah. Anyway, so um, I actually got taught something now because I wasn't aware of them. And I think generally I know quite a lot about the country, but that one I didn't know. Um, so next up, Wolfish Bay, the flamingo we wanted to bring last week. <laughs> yeah, just another funny experience of mine, you know. Um, I, I, I tend to get myself into quite difficult situations when trying to get the good, a good photograph. So th this time I kind of walked into the middle of what looked like a, a dry plain, but turned out to be mud. And I was up to my shins in, in um, what felt like sinking sand. Yeah. trying to capture these flamingos who anytime i walk a step closer they walk 10 steps further so it's quite funny <laughs> flamingos don't seem to be very afraid of cars but they are petrified of humans when they're on foot so yeah. i did manage to get some quite interesting shots but um i think i lost the shoe um in the mud somewhere so it was oh. quite a funny experience but this kind of scenery is 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 you know it's you know Again, it's just so exquisite to just drive the coastline and then you just have this kind of stark contrast between these beautiful, delicate, feminine-looking flamingo and then you have the kind of factory um, of Vulpus Bay and everything in the background. And I, I, I found that contrast so beautiful. Um, yeah. But I've always been drawn to flamingo. You know me. I, yeah. I harp on about them all the time. <laughs> But you so know, just, you know what, what is the funny feature of, uh, of their beak is they've got like a little sif in, the, in there. So what they do, they, they always seem to be taking their head and, and moving it forward through the water. That's exactly what they do. They're, they're siphoning out the plankton that they want to eat and the little mussels and, and keeping the, the bigger dirt that they don't want, they keep out. So they eat the plankton, not the fish? Yeah, no, there's a, they will eat fish if they get it. But when they sort of march and just uh, sort of always move their head uh, frontwards, you know, as if they sort of uh, cooling off their beacon and taking it forward again, it's actually to oh, take, I they, I they take water through. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah, we must actually so that's what uh, they're doing. I just thought that... Yeah. But here you can see the scenes of like Bobbish Bay in the background and then the flamingo in the foreground. It's quite, yeah. it's quite a beautiful sight. Yeah. Um, so that's just why I wanted to share that today. Yeah, and it is a, it is a nice sight because um, you get those... <laughs> I see what you mean. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, I was covered. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but um, I, I know for a fact you, you obviously get them in Wolfish Bay and then also in the lagoon in Lydritz. Uh, because as a child, when I was yes. there, I remember always seeing them down there. I think we have spoken about those um, previously. Yeah. In Henties, um, they fly past us, teasing us, but none of them settle. So yeah. they must be on their way to um, Either you know, place, wherever yeah. they're going. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. quite sure at Conception Bay, I, I seem to remember I saw some as well. So everywhere where you've got a bay, you know, where there's a bit of a lagoon, and that's obviously where they're best off because that's why how they find their food. Exactly. Well, they're very beautiful, so yeah. I, I don't get enough of them. Yeah, they are, and they're extremely nice. So uh, up next, we'll see next week. Uh, you are bound to be back here in Windhoek, so let's see what yes. you can tell us then. Uh, there are bound to be a bit of uh, a change in your life, uh, as you indicated to me personally. And uh, so I'm trying to see how I can get Chloe organized for us to still write and still report to us and still do these sort of shows for us, um, but not always in Namibia, but also beyond. So let's see, 10 degrees south is really where she's aiming next. So let's see where it takes us. Uh, this journey is far from over. Exactly, Frank. So I'll see you next week. Yes, sure. Keep well. And thanks for okay, making keep time. Well. Okay, stop. Bye bye.
Right, and that was uh, Chloe Deer uh, from up at the Skeleton Coast, um, uh, bringing us news of what's going on there, what she found exciting, and hopefully what you will find exciting. Up next, uh, I've got a little uh, video which uh, Matthias Ricardo uh, uh, sort of compiled for us. It's uh, made up of snippets of video clips which I took, uh, little interviews at the Liesenheim and uh, at Heia Lodge. I tried to also get right to Okapuka Lodge, but unfortunately that didn't work out. They didn't have the time to talk to us. Um, but be it as it may, it was just uh, to show you that there are people out there who are trying to find alternatives uh, to remain positive and, and, and still do their tourism thing, um, trying to get small income to just make ends meet until the, finally the, the tourism industry starts to at least show some form of recovery. I think there is a bit of recovery, but it's a slow process as we all expected. Uh, you will have to excuse the fact that the one interview is in German, the second one is in English, but obviously this is a, a show which we try to keep bilingual in many uh, respects. So if you don't understand the German, just forward to the English part. Um, but anyway, here's the video. Ja, wir sind hier draußen auf äh, Elisenheim und äh, vor mir sitzt natürlich Pierre Werner. Hallo Pierre. Yes, alles so right. Nee, da ist kein Nonsens. Ähm, ja, wir sprechen hier so halbes Südwesterdeutsch, aber können wir machen es mal so ein bisschen formeller. Also auf dem <lacht> ja, nee, klar. <lacht> ja, man muss da vielleicht dran denken, dass äh, Pierre und, und I sind äh, so ungefähr eine Nummer gut befreundet, haben so diverse kleine Musikeinlagen yes, ja. sogar vorgemacht. Genau, yes, ja. Äh, Pierre, sag mir mal, wie habt ihr das gemacht mit dieser ganzen Covid-Sache? Wie seht ihr das jetzt in der Zukunft auf euch zukommen? Mann, wir sind jetzt von Farmers Kitchen sind wir sechs Jahre, sechs Jahre sind wir on the run. Wir haben 16 Angestellte und hatten natürlich in der Covid-Zeit mit dem ersten Lockdown mussten wir natürlich auch zumachen. Für einen Monat haben unsere Leute gehalten, weiter bezahlt. Im zweiten Monat haben wir dann angefangen mit Takeaways und einfach wieder weiterzumachen und so. Aber da wir ja hier draußen sind, sind kein Restaurant in der Stadt. In Liesenheim haben wir, wir haben uns immer von Anfang an auf die Locals ein bisschen mehr spezialisiert. Also nicht nur auf den Tourismus und das muss ich sagen, das hat uns ja, auf gut Deutsch den Hintern gerettet. Mhm. Also wir haben, wir haben dadurch sind wir immer noch, haben weiterhin sonntags unsere, unsere Leute, die hier essen kommen. Durch die Woche, nachmittags um 4 Uhr ist der Laden offen und die Leute haben, kommen nach wie vor. Mhm. Und da wir natürlich von den Eltern her den Campingplatz noch haben, die paar Touristen, die hier sind, integriert sich das auch immer schön. Also und, Mix, wir haben einen gesunden Mixer. Ja. Und sag mal, du, du sagst jetzt die Touristen, die, die kommen wieder. Ähm, also nimmt das so peu à peu oder ist das schon maßgeblich? Es ist natürlich nicht so, wie, wie, wie das vorher war. Aber ich sag mal, da wir ja von der Lage her hier ziemlich mit nah an Windhoek sind, haben wir, haben wir natürlich äh, den Vorteil, dass wir ähm, dass, äh, dass die Leute natürlich nicht gerne in Windhoek aber trotzdem nah an Windhoek mm. sein wollen. Und ist es dann so, dass ihr lokal auch ein bisschen besser Unterstützung habt wieder? Oder Denn also euer Problem Camp ist eigentlich vom Lokaltourismus immer gewesen, dass ihr eigentlich zu nah wart wieder? Oder das was? ist wieder zu nah. Also das sage ich mal, das ist die Leute wollen, wenn sie am Wochenende wegfahren, wollen sie natürlich nicht nur zehn Minuten fahren, weil man möchte dann, dann schon mal gerne auch, ob das auf dem Weg nach Swakopmund ist oder in die Kalahari mhm. oder in den Süden oder ein bisschen in den Norden, sprich mal jetzt Pilze suchen, ist jetzt ja. gerade ganz angesagt. Das ist aber von dem her, ja von den Locals da haben wir nicht. Wir haben zwar oben beim Damm bei uns viele Leute. Wollte ich gerade sagen, da Damm, wahrscheinlich wieder mehr. Zum Damm gehen viele Leute, gerade weil da Wasser ist. Mhm. 
Vater hat die Insel umgebaut. Ich habe das gesehen neulich, er hatte da so einen kleinen Videoclip dabei. Da ist alles, also daher haben wir, Kleinvieh macht auch Mist. Ja. So die Locals, die Touris, das Restaurant, was Jana und ich natürlich machen, ja. das jobbt eigentlich ganz gut. Ja, ich kann mich da erinnern, letztes Jahr, die, die Weihnachtsfeier war ja so das erste Mal richtig groß, ja. wieder nachdem, nachdem man eigentlich also die Covid-Sache so ein bisschen hinter sich gelassen richtig. hatte. Richtig, ein Glück durften wir da auch. Und das war natürlich toll, also der Weihnachtsmarkt, die Leute sind hungrig, die mm. hungrig nach wieder ähm, und wir sind alle soziale Wesen, die Leute wollen gerne so miteinander es. was machen. Schade, dass wir kein Schlachtefest machen konnten, aber mm. da sind wir, sobald wir das Go-Ahead haben, dass dann wir kommt sowas das wieder. wieder machen würden, machen wir das natürlich weiter. Ja, und dann habt ihr natürlich hier oben noch diesen, diesen beinahe hätte ich gesagt, Family Hideout da. Ja, die Hütte, die ist auch nach wie vor, das ja. wird unter, den El unter die Eltern. Ach so, und die machen also mehr den Campingplatz und solche und Sachen und genau, ihr das Restaurant. Wir haben die, wir haben die äh, Betriebe getrennt, dass jeder natürlich sein Ding hat, worum er sich kümmern muss. Und wir, Jana und ich, machen das Restaurant, die Eltern mm. machen... Die Eltern machen alles, was mit Accommodation zu tun hat, sprich den Campingplatz oder die Hütte oder ja. den Campingsite. Und der 4x4-Trail ist natürlich auch sehr... Und den kann ich anempfehlen, den bin ich nicht schon mal gefahren. Und da ja. kenne ich auch den Damm da hinten. Ist natürlich immer ein bisschen besser, wenn man hier an der Hütte vorbeifährt und dann rüber. Denn das andersrum wird es ein bisschen schwierig mit der Wand da hinten. Ja, das ist ein bisschen schwer, aber gibt es ja zwei. Einmal an der Wand hat man hinten rum den Chicken Run, nennen wir den. Ach so. <lacht> da kann man auch noch lang fahren. Also man ist nicht gezwungen. Und das Schöne ist, also die Route ist geschrappt. Ja. Und wir haben äh, ähm, dadurch macht man sein Auto nicht so kaputt. Ja, ja. Und eine kurze und eine lange Route ist auch. Also ja, und dann, was, was zum Beispiel auch schön war, kann ich mich immer erinnern, hier oben eine Nacht in der Hütte und dann hinterher am nächsten Morgen halt den 4x4. Richtig, das kann man das, auch. Ja, also ja. die Optionen sind gegeben und mhm. da kann sich jeder, da sind wir auch ganz flexibel, sprich die Eltern, das ist alles gar kein Problem. Und sag, wie seht ihr die Zukunft jetzt demnächst? Weitermachen. Einfach nicht weitermachen. Einfach mal. Weiß ja keiner, was die Politik uns äh, beschert. beschert, was Europa uns beschert, da wo unser Meister Tourismus herkommt. Ja. Wir müssen einfach mal gucken. Ja. Und ansonsten, Namibianer sind einfach flexibel. Also dann müssen wir was anderes machen. Das nützt nichts. Ja, ja. Aber wie ist das? Das Restaurant ist gut besucht? Das Restaurant ist gut besucht. Der Mensch muss essen und trinken. Ja. Nun seid ihr ja auch gleich hier in der Nähe von dem Elisenheim Village. Ich nehme an, das hat euch so einen kleinen Vorteil gebracht. Durch die Woche sowieso. Die größte Unterstützung kommt von den Elisenheimern. sind wir auch sehr dankbar. Und wir haben eine... Wir haben, sag mal, einen Kundenstamm, von dem, sag ich mal, 90 Prozent Stammkunden sind. Das heißt, das harmonische Arbeiten und dass die Leute hierher kommen mit unserem, mit unserem Staff und sowas. Mhm. Der Staff kennt unsere Kunden, unsere Kunden kennen den Staff. Und ich kann mit Stolz sagen, dass seitdem wir offen sind, keinen unserer Leute verloren haben und äh, also alle, noch, alle noch bei uns sind. Und äh, die Küche sehr gut mit dem Service funktioniert. Ich glaube, unser Konzept geht auf. Ja, dann danke ich dir für das kurze Gespräch und wünsche euch viel Glück. Gerne, gerne. Okay. Halte die Ohren steif. Ja.
Okay, we're here with Mandoli Fifis of uh, Heya Lodge outside Windhoek, and uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Mandoli, uh, tell us a bit about what is going on at Heya Lodge, because it was quite funny when our phone that told me it was locked down. At the moment, we are quite um, uh, juggling it to keep it above water. Uh, since the COVID struck, uh, most of our weddings and conferences were obviously cancelled due to the um, COVID rules and everything going on. So at this stage, we are juggling it where we can. Uh, we are having quite some few uh, quarantine groups coming in. And when we are not fully booked for quarantine groups, then we are open for the public and obviously our loyal guests that have been coming to AR Lodge for all these years. But it has been a struggle to keep heads above water with everything going on. So, so tell me, so every second week you're closed now, or how does that work then? Um, it depends on how regularly the ships come in, and obviously that also depends on um, how uh, uh, booked we are. If we do have some weddings, we do have weddings coming up now in April again, then obviously we do not take in uh, quarantine groups. But um, when we do get a booking, obviously we do take it in, because you can see in the social um, uh, circles as well. People do not have the spending money that they used to have uh, before COVID struck us. So uh, uh, at the moment, we do have a lot of loyal people coming back to us. But uh, if we are open for more than two or three weeks at a time, you can see that the flow of people coming through to higher Lodge is going down. And obviously, it's also a hard time with regards to weddings, because you cannot plan properly and also to the cap on the quantity of people that is allowed for weddings at this stage. So, so your biggest problem is not that you're not busy at all, it's just you're not as busy as you used to be. Yes, and obviously with a, uh, a lodge our size, I mean we have 50 rooms so we can take up to 100 people and we have quite a big number of staff working here so your overhead stays the same. So unfortunately if you do not hit certain targets then your overhead yeah, start cannot taking cut over. down to, to the bare minimum. Mm. And we also had quite a few... Um, uh, nomad groups that used to come in previously that was also a big source of income and since COVID struck um, they obviously cancelled all of the uh, tours coming through so it's a little bit over a year and a half now that they didn't come through to Aya Lodge at all and uh, previously they would have been here two to three days a week so they booked out the complete lodge so that also makes a huge difference with regards yeah. to that yes. so did you have to lay off any people or were you okay in the year uh, um, we had to lay off a few people luckily not as much as we used to so we went and we looked at uh, the people that was here less than six months or a year um, oh, okay. but we were able to keep most of our stuff um, but unfortunately we were also one of these that had to look on the overheads but like yeah. I say uh, most of them we were able to keep and going forward and we're working as a team so that's why we're trying mm. everything we can so so um, when you are open you you are you have got your normal uh, working hours yes we have our normal working hours from six in the morning until nine in the evenings when the restaurant closes and obviously okay. with the curfew that is still on um, and then we have our normal Sunday buffets from 12 until three in the on, on Sundays uh, which is always a nice place for the whole family family to come through as we have enough space for all the yeah. children and then obviously in the week if we are open we have our normal a la carte set menu that people can yeah. attend to yeah. and obviously then also the rooms that they can book out if they want to come out for uh, uh, out of the city <laughs> drive yeah. not too far how, how does that actually work in your case if you've got a person living here yeah. is he allowed or she to still order alcohol after eight um, if, if the person is here on site, obviously the boss has to close at 8 because that is according to, to the, the, yeah, rules, to the now. rules. But um, if you want to go and, and buy, for instance, a bottle of wine and you go to your house, then obviously there's no rules with regards to okay. that. But we adhere to all the normal COVID yeah, rules that yeah. is there. So, so are you looking forward to, to a better season in the coming year or are you still cautious? We are still cautious. Obviously, winter is approaching again, yeah. and uh, I personally don't think we'll be out of the woods till this year. Looking at everything that's going on, I'm sure we'll go back into a bit of a stricter lockdown again, going forward uh, to the to the middle of winter. Definitely, especially with the fact that the vaccines are also yeah. not fully. Um, 
you know, available, available yet. yet. Yeah. Um, but at this stage, I do think it will be better than last year, especially I think people as as they've come used to it we know how to handle it now and mm. i don't think it's as much chaos and and everybody is not as scared as they used to do yeah. so at least at this stage we know how to sanitize and wear the mask and keep safe but you can go on with a kind of normal living so definitely with the people coming to the lodge we can see that slowly started to pick up um, but yeah, I don't think we'll be back to the normal tourism from people coming from overseas just yeah, yet. So it will only pick up gradually. Yes, I definitely think so. Hopefully from what I think is maybe mostly from August going downwards to the end of the year, if there's not any major spikes in yeah, COVID cases yeah. again. Well, we hope and wish yeah. that it all yeah. goes well. <laughs> definitely. So, so thank you for quickly speaking to me. This was a very short notice interview, so thanks for making no the problem. time. No problem. Thank you so much for coming out to Haya Lodge. Okay. Right, and as you can see, um, there are people out there who still find ways and means to, to wangle the system, if I can call it that way. Hopefully there are more of you and some of you who actually catch up on ideas and, and maybe think of talking to me yourselves and, and, and telling me more about what you do to, to fix your situation. We'll be shortly uh, um, starting with the program in this regard as well a little video clip once a week that we hope to bring out where we'll sort of focus on what Namibians do in, in, uh, during these hard times and, and how they manage to get by and, and, and make plans to, to, like I said, make ends meet. So let's see how it develops. We hope to have that ready by the end of the month. But until then, I remain. And furthermore, I remain until the next show next week. I hope you had a bit of fun watching this uh, short show. And... Um, Keep healthy and remain safe. Until then, bye.